art is about what it means to society. Art is, it's about something new. It's about us reflecting upon society, discovering ourselves both at an individual level and at a cultural level. So these things aren't really art, right? <laughs> They're not really art, but they are a part of society and they are changing how we communicate. Today's guest is the chairman and CEO of Founderspace, a global innovation hub for entrepreneurs, corporations, and investors. Please welcome to the inspiration place, Steve Hoffman. Well, hey there, Steve. Welcome to the show. Hey there, Miriam. It's fantastic to be here. Well, I'm so excited to have you. I do have your book, Five Forces. And we were saying right before you hit record, we had done a connection call about what you could possibly talk about with the audience. And you said, well, maybe AI. And I go, well, maybe. And since we spoke, suddenly it's like, that's all anyone wants to talk about. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Everybody's talking about art and AI. And this is something I've been saying for years. When I was saying it early on, and I wrote a book about it, The Five Forces, which is pretty recent, but ahead of the explosion, which just happened with Dolly and you know, open AI and everything people are doing. But I have been a long believer because I understand technology. I'm an engineer by training, like yourself. I'm an engineer. Um, and I understood early on that machines could create art. This is a, both a philosophical discussion we can have, as well as a technical discussion and a social one. You know, what is art? But I could see early examples, especially in the areas, now we're seeing it in the visual arts, but early on, we could see it in the areas of music. This has been around a while, where literally computers could create music that were indistinguishable to the listener from human-created music, and they could do it through algorithms. And if something is indistinguishable, does that mean it's art or is it not art, right? If it was created by a machine or created by a human. But honestly, to the listener, and they don't know, it's art, right? Because they are just experiencing the music or the visuals for what they are. When they find out it's a machine, does it change how they view the art? Of course. And what we're seeing now in society is absolutely amazing. It's going to fundamentally transform what art is, how we create art, what entertainment is, our entire society and communication. Yeah. So there's a couple of tools that I've been looking at. Some of them I've been very impressed with. Some of them not so impressed. Can, can I be controversial and talk about the one I'm not? Yes, with? absolutely. Okay. All right. So there's this app and a lot of artists have been playing with it. It's Sensa AI. So oh, yeah. That's the one for those who aren't sure, if you've been on Instagram for any length of time in the end of 2022, people were sharing all kinds of selfies with that app. To me, they all look the same. I was like, oh, it's another sense of selfie. Even before I would read the description. Oh you yeah, you can spot them a, a million miles away. <laughs> yeah, so that's not impressive to me. You know, like it's like, okay. And then the other thing that I saw that was similar was Pantone for their color of the year. So uh, for, again, for those who don't know, every year Pantone kind of does a color prediction and it's not so much a crystal ball thing. They're kind of looking at the zeitgeist and seeing what is starting to trend and they pick up on what's already becoming a trend and what you'll see more of a trend. And they said, the color of 2023 is magenta. They're doing a play on words with the magenta verse. Are you familiar with what it is I'm talking about? So Pantone actually yep. used artificial intelligence to generate what they thought this magenta verse looked like. And again, it was all, all purple. Like I said, the purple hair. <laughs> of course. Magenta, and it's all purple. Everything's purple. Well, of course, the color is magenta. But to me, it did look, it did look very much like that same kind of sense of computer generated art. So oh, yeah. And, and a lot of this is just trendy stuff. It, it, you know, everybody wants, you know, it's a meme, right? So uh, people are hopping on the bandwagon, they see this tool, they're making a picture of themselves, they're sharing it out there. Why? Because, you know, everybody's doing it. And a lot of people, let's face it, there's good art created by humans, and then there's bad art created by people. A lot of people create bad art. There's machines, the same thing. And yes. honestly, if you studied art history, I know that art isn't just about what you see. Art is about what it means to society. 
art is, it's about something new. It's about us reflecting upon society, discovering ourselves both at an individual level and at a cultural level. So these things aren't really art, right? <laughs> They're not really art, but they are a part of society. Um, and they are changing how we communicate. Like when people are jumping on Lenza and they're making these pictures of themselves, even though they all start to look the same, if you've seen enough of them, it's still a new way of communicating, a way that we didn't do before. And in that sense, it's interesting in the sense of actually, is it going to be transformative art that gets you to look at the world in a different way? Probably not. Yeah. So I don't find it threatening to me yes. as an artist. And one of the things that I found particularly interesting is is when now we talk about the other hot tool, which is OpenAI or ChatGPT. And this is an artificial intelligence tool where Google is completely freaked out about this. So like they are on red alert as they should be. So again, for people who may not know what we're talking about, Steve does, but Steve, just so you know, I always have my listener right with us at the table. Yes. And I'm always taking care of him and her. Okay. So uh, it's like the multi-eyed creature who is with us. All right. So basically, if you wanted to search something on Google, and I'm going to give an example of something that came up last night in my artist incubator coaching program. One of the artists wanted to know, where can I buy um, royalty free music? Mm -hmm. I said, Let's ask Hal. So I call it Hal because that's the computer in 2001 in space. Oh, absolutely. Right. Okay. So let's ask Hal. So the thing is when you go into Google and you say royalty free music sites, it's going to give you first a list of ads links to their sponsored posts. And then it'll give you a list of sites that might mention what it is you're looking for, but you still have to click on each thing and find out what it is. And if it's actually relevant, relevant, did I say that right? Relevant, 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 relevant. <laughs> okay. So when you ask the open AI or chat GPT, or as I'm going to say, Hal, when you ask Hal, it'll say, here are the six sites. And some of them are subscription based. I said, oh, thank you for that. Which ones are not subscription based? And then it tells me. So it's like, saves me hundreds of hours, like wh whatever the procrastinate learning rabbit hole I would have gone down in the past to click on all these links. It just tells me. So Google is completely freaked out. They have a red alert on this because this technology is really going to hurt their business. So yeah? it's interesting. So chat GTP is based on their GTP three algorithm set. And, and it's been, it's a deep learning algorithm that's been trained on a lot of data. They're coming out with GTP four now. So they're going to have a more advanced one that will, that will blow this away. So yes, Google should be worried. Google has its own AI. They're working on their own thing. They haven't released it to the public, honestly. Uh, and Google says this, I believe them actually, because it can be abused in a lot of ways. So uh, we are seeing that these chat algorithms, yes, they could do search. But one thing you have to recognize is I did some searches on there and it didn't do a good job. So you pointed out one where it did a good job. There's others where this open AI chat GPT, which is a horrible name, so hard. To <laughs> why, why is it called that? Do you know? It's GPT stands for, it's a technical term about what they're doing. And because they're engineers, let's face it, they so didn't get, words, they didn't get an NFT, artist to come up like with it. You, you, you can explain to someone what NFT stands for and it still doesn't help them. You it know? doesn't help. It won't it help won't you help at all. You. It's okay. just a technical term, GPT. And the point is, um, I did a search and I asked it, you know, what are the top 20 venture capital firms in Silicon Valley? I was just curious what it would say. And it said, I cannot give you this data. Now, I don't know why it just couldn't do it. And I asked it a couple other specific things like that, and it couldn't give me the data. Now, the data is, I think uh, it's roughly three years old that they trained it on. So it's not even current. Whereas Google is literally updating their database when you do a Google search, you know, every day it's being updated. So wow. there's a difference here. Each one of these, Google is worried, but not, I think the press made a bigger deal out of it than it is. Google could roll this out tomorrow if they wanted to, they All could right. roll it out tomorrow. They're actually concerned because, and they rightly are concerned, OpenAI doesn't care. Their policy is we're just gonna shove it out there and see what happens. Google, because they're a bigger company and they could get a lot of pushback, they know that this tools are extremely powerful. So you can literally get the AI to write stuff for you. You can get it to write fake news for you. Now they have policies against this and they'll try to block it, but you can 
human beings are smart. Right? We're, we're, we, we can figure out how to use the tool to get it to do quite uh, dangerous things to society. So there's a good and a bad with all technology. We've seen this throughout history, right? Computers, the atomic energy, everything else. There's good and there's bad to it. So there's uh, very interesting, amazing things you can do with AI right now and very dangerous things about disinformation and all this stuff. And these algorithms are biased too. They are only as good as their data. And the data they're, they're ingesting right now is biased just like society is biased, right? So it has racial biases. It has you know biases about religion, biases about everything that we have biases about in society. Education, wealth, status, all these different things are baked into this AI that you're using. So the answers it's going to give you back are answers that might not be the right answers in terms of a direction we want to take society with the use of these AIs. Now, putting that aside, these algorithms do amazing things. Not only can they answer questions like you asked, they can be pretty creative. So I asked the algorithm to write me a love poem and it wrote me a love poem. It wasn't a great love poem, but <laughs> it's pretty amazing that the algorithm could do this. It can write a very, very short story. It can't write it that long. It usually, in a way, they're limiting what people can do. They have limits on their own server capacities, you know, their processing power and everything. So they don't allow you to write too much. And the algorithms, honestly, I don't know if they could write a long short story, but they can write a super short story that's really fun to read. But again, I'm not just an engineer like you. I'm a creative guy too. That's why I went into entertainment. I went to film school for grad school. And I'm so I was trying to get it to write really good short stories. And I spent hours and hours and hours. And I will tell you, all the short stories started to sound the same. <laughs> so, yeah. so there's just so many like, things like I want to I interrupt you so badly. Yeah. <laughs> no, first of all, to bring it back to our original conversation to keep it really yeah. cohesive about the yeah. art thing, what I had learned early on about the chat GPT is it really can't give you opinions. Like I think the example I read is which is better, hot dogs or hamburgers or they, it can't do that. And when you're asking what is art, art changes the way, good art changes the way we think. And that starts with having an opinion about something. So there's right. you, that, art without that opinions that's missing. Is art without opinions is just a pretty picture, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, then yeah. you have, like, that's why they all look the same with the purple hair and the purple universe, magenta verse. It's, it's like, there's no so opinion there. This is where the question of can it create art or can't it is really important because what art is, it's a dialogue. Art is a dialogue with society, right? It's, it's reflecting society. It's saying, hey, look at this, look at this a different way. I have an opinion. This is how the, I see the world. I'm challenging you to see the world in a different way. That's what great art is. Throughout history, great art, we know with you know the, the advent of modernism and everything, it's not about how well you can paint or how you know, well you can make a sculpture. It's about what your sculpture is saying to society at this point in history. Yeah. So that's, do these algorithms do that? Honestly, they don't do that, right? However, we could take them and do that ourselves with them. So these algorithms I see are a great, or not a great, but they're a very innovative and very powerful tool in the hands of artists, human beings, to create a next generation, envisioning what a next generation of art, just like a paintbrush, just like a chisel, these are a new tool for creating art, just like when now cinema is art, right? But before the advent of the, of the machine, the cameras and the projectors and everything, we didn't have that art form. We have a new art form with computers, right? It's a new art form. But like you were saying, we as the artist, right? Us as an artist, it's up to us how we use them and then it's also up to society how it interprets what we create and what that means to society itself. Yes, absolutely. And the way I've been using ChatGPT, it's kind of like taking a photograph. Like, you know, the photograph isn't art until the photographer makes it art. Yes. And, you know, this is why we don't look at a single piece of artwork from an artist, right? If you just look at one sculpture or one painting, it doesn't tell you whether the, what the artist is saying. A single frame of a movie, right? We have to look at the artist's body of work. And these algorithms are very good at creating single... <laughs> <laughs> they create single things, but it's up to us how we use them to create a body of work with these new tools that actually says what we want to say over time and changes the nature of art, the nature of society, the nature of philosophy and who we think we are.
I love that. Yeah. So one of the things that we said, it has trouble coming up with opinions. Also, I can't get it to be funny. Yeah. So I tried different voices. I was like, can you even just like get, tell me a joke? I was like, it was really struggled. Like it, it, you it's, it's, your humor it, joke. It, it was bad. Oh yeah. I asked it to tell jokes too. And the jokes are bad. <laughs> not that <laughs> like funny. not even like dad jokes. I mean, it was like, really? but, it, but the, all these things will get better. So there will be a point where the, the, where these algorithms will make you really have belly laughs. There will be a point where these algorithms write actually pretty amazing poetry because what they're doing is what, and this is what I want artists to understand, whether it's, we're talking about chat, chat uh, GPT, which is uh, all text, right? And then there's by the same company, OpenAI, there's Doll E. <laughs> D A L L. Don't know about so tell us about that one. Yeah. So, so Dolly is really cool, especially if you're a visual artist. So, uh, Dolly, what it does, it generates images. It generates images, and it can create paintings. It can create all sorts of cool, you know, visual images, three D art images, and it does this by literally looking at millions and millions of images, and then taking text input and coming up with combining these images in different ways to create stuff. So I asked it the other day to create me something with Einstein. I wanted a picture with Einstein, his ideas and discovery. And it came up with something pretty cool. Did it come up with what, exactly what I wanted? No, <laughs> because, you know, there are too many possibilities out there. And just by typing in text, it's really hard to get something exact. However, there are forums online right now where people are exchanging what they call prompts. And prompts are literally the text that you input to these this AI. All of this is done by inputting text. So chat GTP, you're inputting text. Even on the visual one, Dolly, which is named after the artist Dolly, um, but in Dolly, when you're inputting text, it's taking these texts and then it's searching through its huge database of images and combining them in different ways to give you some output. If you have specific prompts, that trigger certain styles of art, certain other images that prompts that reference other artists or other images in the past, then you can get much higher quality images and images that are much more visually appealing as well as closer to what you would imagine in your head, which is what you're trying to get out of the machine. And I'll add one more thing. The really interesting thing about Dolly of creating these AI generated images is that it not only does it from text, but it can also do it from other images. So you can literally upload images and it will combine these images and create new images out of whatever you upload. So you, Miriam, could upload a bunch of digital images of your paintings and have it create a new Miriam style painting that you could say, wow, here's a, here's that, an art. That cool. Like I can, I can upload my watercolor portraits and then and upload a picture of me and say, okay, now paint me in my own style. Exactly. And that's where that's it gets cool. It gets cool, right? But yeah. so can anybody else who has your pictures. <laughs> so, like, literally, it's yeah. not just you. you. You know, who has ownership over this? We have all these intellectual properties. Okay, this is the elephant in the room is the yes. IP question is like, somebody can take my images without my permission and do that, right? Yeah. So then they create a totally new image, right? They create a new Miriam image in the Miriam style of art. Uh, your watercolors look just like or close enough to one of your watercolors that the average person wouldn't even know it wasn't you. But do they own it? Do you own it? Does the company OpenAI own it? Is it public domain? Who owns these things? We haven't resolved, the courts have not resolved this. There is actually no answer for this. And it's going to be very contentious because you can imagine with your own art or any of your listeners out there with their art, if somebody starts to mass produce art in their style and maybe sell it as NFTs or, you know, sell however they want to sell it, uh, do prints of it, you know, high quality prints, whose intellectual property is that? Right. Like uh, make a painting in Andy Warhol style. I mean, does Andy Warhol foundation, do they get a cut if I sell it? I, I don't know. And people, people are doing that right now. I don't so think you, you can copyright a style. Like if I were to go paint something in the style of without a computer, I think I'm allowed to do that. I need to discuss this with, with. Uh, yeah, and so this is one of the reasons Google player. hasn't re released this to the public. 
Mm. Because Google has a lot more at stake to lose than a, a startup like OpenAI, which is just focused on doing this. To OpenAI, their whole business is this. Google has a much broader business I and mean, it's a much bigger company. So you ask like, why isn't Google doing this when they could do this? Because they have AI just as sophisticated. It's because there are all these unresolved issues that uh, could be quite costly. <laughs> and you know, lawsuits and all these different things. We don't know yeah, as a society what we'll accept. We don't know how to define ownership of these AI generated images that are derivatives of other images that have been uploaded and people's faces too. Like you can upload a person's face and create new faces that are partially based on your own face. Like who owns that new character, right? Do you get royalties from it? Does I write about this in my book, The Five Forces. This technology, and I go further in the book. Like, so I go way out into the future. Like, will films be created this way? Like actors, will they be licensing out their personalities and their faces? When we design a room with a set designer, who the furniture is based on furniture designs that people did and wallpapers, who owns this? How does society treat it? Are we going to actually curb creativity by becoming too focused on the leg legalities of this? You know, there's benefits to both. We've seen, and I just want to say, this is a really important question that we all need to consider. All of us could say, especially any of those who are creative and artists, and I consider myself both a technical guy, but also creative like yourself. My mom was an artist. I'm totally into the arts. Like I grew up with art. I thought I would become an artist. I made games and I did all the animations for those. So I'm really into this from the artist perspective, also into it from a technical and business perspective, kind of combining those. And we as a society, we haven't figured out what to do with this. This technology is so powerful and so transformative that literally we've seen on the web that by not restricting things, by allowing people to share images, you know, on social networks and all these different ways and share content on YouTube, we allowed a creativity explosion, right? An explosion of new ways for people to create. If we curb this AI and say, no, if you anything derived from something else, you're going to have to pay a royalty and we're going to have to track it or we're going to have to block it, then all of a sudden, all these tools will go away. <laughs> like They won't be able to exist. And really, as humanity, I don't think we can turn our back on this technology because uh, the technology has a lot of potential for really doing good and also taking us to a new level of discovery. Like I said, it's a tool, right? We want people to be able to use these tools because we don't know what amazing things we'll be able to create with them until we are allowed to try. Except I'm so worried about the children. The children? The children. So it had caught my attention with chat GPT because I wasn't really paying attention. Yes. There was an article in the New York Times and it was basically, I think it was the Times. It might've been the journal. I don't remember, but basically saying how they used it to write a paper. <laughs> with, oh, with, an essay, a school yeah. essay. Yeah. yeah. It, so the re so it, what caught my attention though was not that ability. It was like, that was kind of like, okay, yeah. I get that. Yeah. What impressed me though, was that the paper was late and the journalist had said that I had written an apology letter using chat GPT. Yes, you could do this. Right. So that was what had got my attention I was like, oh, all those weird customer service things that we're always getting. And then that's what led They're me written. down the rabbit hole. Okay, what else did I do with this? Yeah. I was just amazed. Like it could help me with these nuanced it's a, things. It's it's insane. See, even the news you're reading now, a lot of the news online about weather and finance, especially, is written by AI and you don't know it. Like you have no idea. You're written on, on services like Spotify and things like that. They're actually so they don't have to pay royalties, they are generating AI music and actually putting it out there. You may be listening to some of this that is actually AI generated. I and am listening to it. You know, I, I subscribe to the service called Focus at Will, and it all sounds like computer generated. Yes, because they don't have to pay royalties. To no, so it's like being. different modes. And one of them is the classical mode. And yes. my daughter, who is a classically trained cellist, like she went to conserve, like the real deal, went to a conservatory. And she's like, well, it sounds familiar, but I can't tell what it is. And I was like, oh, it's artificial. It's, it's AI. So we will be seeing this in the background. And you're worried about the children. So let I'm me wor I'm worried about about kids not developing the skills they need to use this properly as a tool. I know. So I want to take you back in time, Miriam. You know, remember when we were kids and everybody's worried about the calculator? 
like kids won't learn math. There's calculators out there. You know? They don't. They don't, <laughs> they they never... don't. And they don't know how to spell either. And penmanship, forget that. Like yeah. I, I and penmanship. Remember. But honestly, the kids will get by. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the kid. This is it. Human beings will learn what they need to learn to function and, and get ahead in society. The ones who are given a, a good parenting and good education, they will learn what they need to learn and what they don't need to learn. They don't care. Right. And honestly, and if they need to learn it at some future time, they'll learn it. We don't have to worry about that. This is maybe what we have to worry about. We have more we have to worry, worry about is cheating. Right. Because yes. uh, kids, yes. because kids are smart. <laughs> if they can get an AI to write their essay, why not? Right. Then they don't have to write their essay. They don't have to stay up late and write their essay. Who, who wants to write an essay? If they can get an AI to get them into college, help, you know, tell them what they need to put down in their application and everything they need, they'll do it. So people, everybody is going to use these tools however they can. And the smarter they are, these uh, kids are, the more they're going to actually use these tools, right? <laughs> the the, the smarter true. kids okay. are going to be the first ones to jump on these, figure out how to tweak them and use them to their, their maximum benefit. Just like you, you and I are doing right now, right? <laughs> with, with all these tools. You could call it cheating, but we all cheat, right? Every we, Society using technology and innovate, every time you make an innovation, it's cheating cheating, right? Because you're doing things not the hard way. You're using technology to, to do it the short way and often do it better than people who spend a lot of time doing it the old way. So everybody is going to be cheating with this technology, but cheating is actually how we learn and grow and how we understand uh, to how business is done, right? Every business wants to get ahead of its competitors. So they're going to figure out how you were in hedge funds. You know, these hedge funds started using AI very early on and big data to actually cheat the stock market, get ahead of- uh, That's why they hired me. <laughs> exactly, out of MIT. I was, I was in an AI lab. This is the dirty secret. So I was in like a, a very, like this was infancy AI, knowledge-based yes. expert systems. I was so bored. I was like, there's no way this is going to help the world. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the money? <laughs> right. Where's the money? I know. You well, just have to wait. <laughs> yeah, so- uh, yeah, where, where were we going with that? Anyway, this has been such an important conversation, Steve. Thank you so much for taking the time. I want to tell my listeners, you want to go deeper, The Five Forces That Change Everything. It's an excellent book. I have it. And his other books, Surviving a Startup, Make Elephants Fly, all published by three of the top tier publishers. So he's been vetted by the creativity gods. Um, Steve, do you have any last words for our listeners before we call this podcast complete? Yes. I just want to tell your listeners, you can cheat too. Like you could take, you could take AI and you can start using it in your art in amazing ways to allow you to do things you never did. Don't just dismiss it and say, it's not art. It's just a tool. It's up to you how you use it. I love that. It's legal cheating. Yes. Yes. Unless it's, unless you're an English student in high school and it's for your AP paper, then it's not. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for being with me here today. I'll see you the same time, same place next week. Until then, stay inspired.